Geo, a ticket to Melbourne with it without helmets. Bangkok for the mystery of the Thai Silk King. Tokyo, a day in the life of Japan with 100 photojournalists. Tavarua, a South Pacific island blessed with the best surf on the planet. The Enterprise, a floating island at sea. The Pacific Rower, one man's adventure in a small boat attempting to cross a big ocean. Geo, a ticket to the world. This special edition on the Pacific with host Charles Haid from Hill Street Blues. Featuring Geo contributor Pamela Bellwood from Dynasty and Geo correspondent Mike Saray. Bangkok, Thailand. The house on the Klong built by the Farang, or foreigner. The man who lived here was a millionaire, a silk merchant and a spy. His clothes are still in the closet, but he disappeared years ago, somewhere in the mountains of Malaysia. A tragic victim of wild animals, or aborigines claim his friend. Others believe he was a victim of his notoriety or his clandestine past. Jim Thompson, the missing American expatriate who was the legendary Thai Silk King. What makes Thai Silk different is its nubby, stiff quality. It lends itself to many uses. But it wasn't until it was used for costumes in The King and I that the world outside of Thailand became familiar with it. Jim Thompson is the mysterious character who resurrected the Thai silk business and who also celebrated the country that we used to call Siam. The yarn of life, the thread of history, and the silk that comes from a caterpillar's cocoon. Spun into a filament as strong as steel for its weight, Silk fibers can reflect light and color brilliant as gems. Jim Thompson's legend does not include the discovery of silk, but he did discover the Muslim weavers living across the Klong who had kept alive the dying art of Thai silk making. They could make only an inch or two a day and only enough for a sarong or use. Jim Thompson was fascinated by the product and the process. He gave the weavers foot-driven looms that could make larger and more uniform pieces of silk. He introduced them to the Swiss dyes that would make the colors more vibrant and lasting than their vegetable dyes. He revived a lost art and turned it into a thriving cottage industry that would produce Thailand's most famous export, Thai silk. Jim Thompson, the Princeton man who wanted a more adventurous life than that of his Eastern high society background. He secretly came to Thailand in 1945, an agent for the OSS, the forerunner of the CIA. After the war, he helped renovate Bangkok's Oriental Hotel, the literary watering hole for the likes of Maum, Conrad, and Kipling. His partners in the venture included a French correspondent and a Thai prince, Prince Panupond. He started with, Jim didn't want to go back home. He wasn't so happy in America, is what he said. He didn't want to go back. He wanted to live here. Jim Thompson liked to stroll down to afternoon tea to show off his silk samples to Western guests. He'd place a brilliant swath of silk around a woman's neck and tell her how it had changed the color of her eyes. When he finally managed to open the eyes of Vogue's fashion editor, 
Thai silk instantly became part of the world's couture. One could find the man from Delaware by simply addressing a letter, Jim Thompson, Bangkok. As Somerset Maugham would describe it, sometimes a man hits upon a place to which he mysteriously feels that he belongs. Once the Venice of the East, Bangkok filled in many of its clongs in favor of more traffic and urban sprawl. Jim Thompson's traditional house on the Klong was an oasis of Thai art and culture. He refused air conditioning and other modern conveniences. His dinner parties attracted international celebrities and dignitaries who adopted him as a cultural ambassador. Connie Mangskow was a friend and frequent guest at his house on the Klong. Oh, we had kings and queens and princesses and uh, all kinds of people here. Ethel Merman would sing Hello, Dolly, to his pet Macau. Catherine Hepburn would tend to his garden. Jim Thompson became the darling of the foreign press. His biographer, William Warren, remembers him as a great interview, an even better storyteller. He also said that the reason the silk looked the way it did was because it was washed in the waters of this clong, which are not very clean. And I don't think there's any, certainly no truth in that. Jim Thompson never made a fortune in the Thai silk business, like most people believed he did. He was a millionaire, but only by inheritance, and he lived on his Thai salary. When he disappeared, he had only $200 in his bank account and owned less than a quarter of the Thai silk company. Easter weekend, 1967. Jim Thompson, and his friend, Connie Mangskow, travel to Malaysia's Cameron Highlands for a vacation at a friend's guest house. He said he was tired, he was going to rest also, but he didn't that day after we had the picnic lunch. I heard somebody walking, thought maybe it was Jim going for a walk or something. Then when we came out, we met later. But he, uh, he, he wasn't around. Malaysian mountain troops, Aboriginal hunters, American helicopters combed the surrounding area. After 10 days, they found nothing, not a shred of clothing, nor a trail of broken twigs, nothing to suggest that he might be lost or the victim of wild animals. Something else must have happened to the Thai Silk King and former spy. His houseman still keeps the dining room table set for a homecoming dinner party at the house on the Klong in the country that Jim Thompson always called the Kingdom of Siam. This is Mike Saray in the South Pacific, in search of the missing Pacific rower. Peter Berg was running out of food in his bid to be the first to row across the Pacific alone. An entry in his film diary captured his despair upon discovering a change in weather patterns was pushing him backwards. It's got me. It's got me. I've just... I'm sick of the whole thing. I'm sick of the sun. I'm sick of the blue. I want to see something green for a change. It's just blue, 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 and I'm, it makes me feel blue. It's Easter. And I'd love to be stuck in a traffic jam. <laughs> you see what I'm seeing right out there? I've seen it three times now. All right, which direction again? Fire! Look for it now, look for it. It had been six months since Peter Bird had seen another human being. 
He had lost 30 pounds and was rationing what food he had left. He would celebrate his 36th birthday with friends, bearing the gifts of food and water he would need to continue. Watch this. To, to hell with the expense. An approaching cyclone forced us to cut our reunion after only a few hours, and Peter Byrd was cut loose to continue the last half of his solo voyage across the Pacific. I know that it's just one oar stroke at a time. You don't want to take that oar stroke, but once it's gone, then the next one's there. It's just, that's all I can say about it. It's just like life. Three cyclones and 3,000 miles ahead lies Peter Bird's most threatening obstacle, Australia's Great Barrier Reef, where our story will continue. 100 photographers and a day in the life of Japan coming up. But next, football and sport the way the Australians live it.